Hi, so I'm going to be sort of in the business of um, a history lesson, and I hope you'll all interact with me as we do this. Ready when you are. So I'm here to talk about the real sustainability issue in InnerSource, which is not the fact that co some companies freeload or free ride and don't pay their dues. That's not really a problem. The problem is not knowing how to make the right choices for the future of the movement. And so I'm interested in talking about those choices through the lens of history. So first of all, we won, yay us. Everybody can clap now, woohoo. You might be getting tired of hearing that we won, but as somebody who spent the last 20 years talking and at the beginning it was a bit of an echo chamber, it's pretty amazing to me. So and that means that we have a whole new influx of recruits. People are flooding into the open source world and they have great intentions and they're, they're excited and they have all the energy that I had 20 years ago and, and it's really super good that they're here. However, they don't really understand or don't seem to understand this standing on the shoulders of giants concept. There's a lot of I'm in reinventing or I'm taking ownership and I get that impulse but I think this was an important thing. So now a, a quiz, who knows who this is? Anybody? That is Bill Joy. Arguably the first open source developer, he created the BSD project because he thought that he could port Unix to work on a PDP when he was at Cal. Um, this one, good job, that's Richard Stallman and you all guys, you guys all know what he did. Even though we're talking about open source today, it wouldn't exist without the free software movement and without his vision to do that. He's kind of our Moses in a way. Um, this guy? Larry Wall, Larry Wall wrote Pearl. Pearl is why Tim O'Reilly got interested in open source. Pearl was the first really diverse open source community because he wanted to see women take an equal role. The first president of his foundation was a woman. How about this one? Anybody? That is Ian Murdoch. He started Debian, unfortunately we lost him a couple of years ago now, almost two years ago now. Um, brilliant, brilliant guy. The open, doc, uh, uh, open document, I'm sorry, the thing that the, o, that the OSI uses to say whether or not a license is open was sort of his. All right, um, Brian Bellendorf. You guys know Brian? Started Apache. He was a kid. He was like, why can't we all play together here? <laughs> How about this one? Anybody? That is Mitchell Baker. She was fired from her job by AOL for vetting changes through the community process. They thought she was the problem. She went home, dusted herself off, and continued to run her project from her house. And all of the engineers continued to defer to her. Okay, how about this one? And why is Tim in here? He made money. We don't like him, right? No. <laughs> For many years, Tim hosted meetings and get-togethers and helped us work through our early problems. So this is my version of the timeline. If you guys saw the keynotes yesterday, this is not my resume. This is open source's resume, up to 2000. And if you guys have been down to the OSI booth, you have an opportunity to put yourself on this timeline, wherever it is you come in. And of course, it's a longer one, the one they have. One more hero. Anybody know this guy? This is Josh Berkus. He's just a regular guy. He's very involved in Postgres, but he's not a luminary like some of the other people. But what he is, is really brave. And what he did is write this post while he was an employee of Sun Microsystems. Why was this brave? Because this was telling Sun they were screwing up. You don't have to write any of this down. Just look for Josh Burke's destroy and you'll find that blog. <laughs> That's bravery. Now we're gonna switch and talk about companies. Companies optimize for profit. Most companies optimize for profit, unless it's a B Corp that is optimizing for, for uh, benefit. And that's important to you because it helps you understand why they like to massage the message so much. Okay, they really, really like to massage the message. They like to say things that aren't necessarily true. One of your jobs as an employee of that company is to call that out. It's scary, but it's worth doing. Even some of our best friends need to hear that from time to time. Um, I like Red Hat as a company and I'm really glad that they su support this conference, but um, they had to be reminded by the reverse engineering of, of uh, their operating system when they stopped posting code changes, right? Personally, I think that open source is already a masterpiece and does not need editing. <laughs> and so coming up with new licenses that force people to pay if they use the code, all of that stuff, I know from my 20 years that that is wrong. I know that open source developers are superheroes and have the power to keep this thing going, but the new kids need to know a little bit more, and that's why we're doing the Open Sources 3 book, which is stories from the trenches of open source that we forgot to write down while we were living them. 
So um, if you have a good story that you think should be in there, by the way, this is the gratuitous, you know, my boss sent me here kind of thing, <laughs> but I'm going to keep talking about the other slide. Um, please come to us and tell us that story, or write it down at opensource.com and we'll find it. But we're actively editing stories from now until May into a book that is advice for the trenches. Okay? Thank you very much.